question and okay. So I, I will be your friendly moderator t this evening. Um, so the way that this poster session is going to be structured is that we have four posters um, and our lovely presenters. I'll give everyone a brief introduction and they will have five minutes to present their poster and then we'll have time for one to two follow-up questions after each presenter and then after all of our presenters have gone there will be an uh, extended Q&A session until the end of our time. So I think Okay, we our final presenter is just entering the room. Um, so if, if that's everyone here, I will start to moderate. Okay. So our first presenter this evening is uh, Tatum Oleskowitz uh, over here with us at the VCBH. Uh, Tatum, uh, you can share your screen to, do you have your poster up? You're also muted. I don't know if you're trying to communicate. Yeah, just one moment. Cool. Yes, that's the other thing I forgot to mention is that um, uh, poster presenters, please share your screen when it's time for you to present your poster because I don't have your posters. All right, Tatum, you're muted. I don't know if you're trying to speak yet. There we go. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is make it large. So play from start. Can everyone see that? I know that the text is kind of small. It's showing up on screen share. I think you might be able to like zoom in on certain parts if you'd like. Let's see. Apologies for this technological confusion here. You're okay. our guinea pig. Okay, cool. Okay, well, hopefully that is readable to you guys. So, hi there. My name is Tatum Alaskowitz. I am a clinical psychology PhD student here at the University of Vermont. I work with Dr. Stacy Sigmund, assisting on her randomized clinical trial um, investigating the efficacy of interim buprenorphine treatment or IBT for opioid use disorder. Today I'll be presenting preliminary findings of this trial. So America's opioid crisis continues to ravage individuals and society at large, driving viral disease transmission, overdose, death, and other health consequences and imposing, an, imposing a $78 billion economic burden. These consequences are often more pronounced in rural America. Opioid agonist therapy, or OAT, with buprenorphine or methadone is um, efficacious in reducing these consequences, but need for treatment far outstrips treatment capacity. Um, and in rural regions of the country, individuals with OUD can wait for treatment slots for um, months to years. And so we need to expand access to OAT. In 2016, we completed a randomized 12-week pilot study that evaluated the initial efficacy of a technology-assisted interim buprenorphine tr uh, treatment. In this trial, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, 25 individuals were randomized to IBT and 25 to the waitlist control group. IBT individuals visited the clinic every two weeks to ingest their dose. They provided urinalysis specimens that test for commonly abused drugs, and they received their remaining doses via a metawheel device, which is a secure medication storage device that holds up to 28 days of medication across locked cartridges. They also received interactive voice recording phone calls. The IVR is an automated phone system that evaluates recent drug use, craving, and withdrawal, and also issues random callbacks twice monthly, instructing participants to come to the clinic and leave a urine sample within 12 hours. They completed three monthly follow-ups. During the first week of the IBT phase, treatment participants also completed a baseline assessment of HIV and hepatitis C knowledge and perceived risk. After taking these assessments, participants received immediate corrective feedback and explanations for incorrect responses via an interactive iPad application developed by our group. They then reviewed an interactive flipbook and a 15-minute video, both administered via iPad, and the HIV and hepatitis C knowledge assessment where it was uh, re-administered immediately following delivery of the educational content. The preliminary outcomes that I'll be presenting today are from our ongoing larger scale trial that expands upon this pilot study in several key ways. So, 
First, um, it increases the duration from three to six months. It also extends to individuals residing in rural, medically underserved geographic areas, and it includes a new component to address opioid overdose risk. So our current sample is 76 individuals, um, 38 in the treatment group and 38 in the wait, 38 in the treatment group and 38 in the waitlist control group. On baseline demographic characteristics, there are no significant differences between our IBT and waitlist control individuals, except in terms of full-time employment, with significantly more IBT individuals reporting full-time employment at intake. And so figure one um, there at the center top shows the effects of IBT on abstinence from illicit opioid use over 24 weeks. Uh, data points represent the percentage of participants who submitted urine specimens with negative results for illicit opioids at intake and at assessments every four weeks thereafter. Participants randomized to the IBT group are achieving significantly greater illicit opioid abstinence than their waitlisted counterparts sustained across the six month study. And at each of these time points, at least 84% of our IBT participants were abstinent for illicit opioids. If you're wondering why illicit opioid abstinence appears to be increasing among waitlist controls, it's because they're getting into treatment. Uh, but despite this, there are significant diff differences at all study time points. On figure two, measures of anxiety and depression, participants randomized to IBT are reporting significantly lower levels of anxiety and depression from intake to studies end. And on figure three, um, which displays HIV, hepatitis C, and opioid overdose knowledge graphs, they're significantly, um, HIV, hepatitis C, and opioid overdose knowledge are significantly increasing as a function of the single iPad delivered educational interventions with improvements generally persisting throughout the six month study. So the current study rep replicates and expands those promising results from the initial pilot study. We're seeing similarly high levels of illicit opioid abstinence that are generally sustained um, over the six month duration. And we're also seeing significant increases in HIV, hepatitis C, and opioid overdose knowledge, knowledge uh, as well as decreases in depression and anxiety symptoms sustained across a six month period. So upon completion of this randomized trial, we hope to contribute additional empirical evidence that low barrier technology assisted buprenorphine dosing can promote sustained illicit opioid abstinence and promote and reduce drug related harms over extended periods in diverse settings. Thanks. All right, thank you Tatum. So we have time for uh, one or two questions um, from anybody who would like you could also pop them in the chat if you'd like. Okay. Um, so it seems like nobody's got any questions at this time. We can return um, at the end of the session when we have question time for everybody. But in the meantime, let's move on to our next presenter. So also from the University of Vermont, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health, uh, we have Heidi Melbostadt. And yeah. Heidi, um, just let me know if you have any issues sharing your screen. Okay. Can you see that, Raina? Great, okay. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for your interest today. Um, I'm going to be presenting um, some research that we're doing about hormonal contraceptive side effects reported by women receiving medication for opioid use disorder and living here in Vermont um, that I'm doing with Dr. Sarah Heil and some colleagues here at the University of Vermont. So I actually ended up um, breaking this poster down to make it a little bit more palatable for you. So I'm gonna present some slides um, about the research. So we know in the United States that unintended pregnancy among women with opioid use disorder is almost twice that of women in the general population. Um, and that's really significant because we know that when women are able to decide if they want to have children, when and how many children they have, it results in significant improvements in their health and in their social and economic well-being. So the most effective way to prevent unintended pregnancies besides abstinence is the use of contraception. However, we also know that among women with opioid use disorder, they are not using contraception effectively. So there's a lot of reasons for this. I'm gonna focus specifically on provider related issues. Um, first of all, in general, we know that access to family planning providers has been declining in rural areas for the last decade. 
and that even among providers who are providing care for women with opioid use disorder or misusing opioids, um, there's some research that suggests that some of them have concerns about the safety and effectiveness of prescribing hormonal contraception because they're worried about possible interactions in medication or changes in efficacy. Um, so in 2019, there was actually a systematic review by T and colleagues looking at the safety and effectiveness of hormonal contraception, um, but they couldn't find any research that had looked at this. So our group um, decided to conduct a secondary analysis. Um, and we used some data that had been collected from participants that were enrolled in a randomized clinical trial here at the University of Vermont which was aimed at increasing hormonal contraceptive use among women who are receiving medication for opioid use disorder and were at risk of unintended pregnancy. So during this trial, there was a six month intervention um, where women um, had the opportunity to meet with healthcare providers for up to 14 visits, um, during which time they were eligible to initiate hormonal contraception um, in any method that they chose free of charge. So if a woman did initiate hormonal contraception at any of those 14 visits that she attended, she was prompted by research staff to report any side effects um, that she was experiencing. And then we went ahead and took those verbatim reported side effects and we, res um, we assigned them standardized terminology using um, MEDRA terms. So when we looked at the results of those 90 women that were enrolled in the two treatment conditions of this trial, 50 of them ended up initiating some form of hormonal contraception. Um, and then overall, uh, we know that they were mostly satisfied with the methods that they had initiated. It's evidenced by just a 14 and 12 percent, respectively, um, among participants who either switched methods or ended up discontinuing them altogether, so a relatively low amount. Um, the total number of side effects that these women reported um, overall was 273. You can see the most common ones listed here. And then I should note that there were no serious side effects that were reported. So that would have indicated that there was some sort of medical intervention that was necessary or hospitalization because of the side effect. So when we looked at the side effects by contraceptive method type, you see here the four methods that women ended up choosing um, during the six month trial. Um, you see here, there were four pill users overall, 10 injection users, 13 IUD users, and 30 implant users. On average, the women used um, the methods they initiated for more than half of the six-month intervention, which suggests that if they did initiate a method, they ended up using it for the entirety of the trial. And then you see um, the most common method um, for all of the contraceptive method types, excuse me, the most common side effect was menstrual cycle and uterine bleeding. And that was reported by 60 to 75% of women um, using method regardless of the method type. And then you see some other side effects here. 50% um, of women using pills reported having headaches. There was some weight gain with injection and IUD users, and then complications associated with the device for implant users. So in conclusion, um, this provides some preliminary evidence that hormonal contraception is safe and tolerable for women receiving medication for opioid use disorder, and there were no serious side effects or evidence of toxicity that had been reported. So overall, it appears that side effects um, were consistent with women in the general population, um, which is very significant. And then the side effects that um, women experienced prompted less than just 15% of them in this trial to change or discontinue their method use. So future research is definitely necessary with larger samples of women and other groups of women with opioid exposure, but it definitely provides um, some great preliminary evidence. Thank you. Thank you for that, Heidi. Um, so now uh, we have time for a few questions for Heidi's uh, presentation. This isn't a question, but I'll just say uh, nice work. It's very rare when you can say that you addressed a question in which there was no research evidence prior. So really cool, really nice effort in uh, addressing a real gap in the literature. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Um, definitely when we were working on Sarah's trial, to her randomized clinical trial, it was really nice to have all of the data that she had been collecting over the past five years to address this. So yeah, we're really excited about it. Thank you. Awesome. Um, does anyone else have anything they wanna say before we move on to our next presenter? 
right then. So our next presenter is Valerie Harder from also from the University of Vermont um, and the as the UVM Center on Rural Addiction. So uh, right. Valerie, Hello. take it away. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right. Share that. Okay. So as she said, um, I'm Valerie Harder. I'm an associate professor at the University of Vermont. My co-authors on this project are from Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine. And we've all come together under the University of Vermont Center on Rural Addiction uh, with Dr. Stacy Sigmund as the principal investigator. The mission of the Center on Rural Addiction, for those who aren't familiar with it, is to expand addiction treatment capacity in rural communities by providing evidence-based technical assistance, consultation, resources, and training to providers and other staff in rural counties across these states. Uh, I'm presenting on rural primary care practitioners' perceptions of substance use disorders and treatment during COVID-19. We conducted a baseline needs assessment in Vermont to help identify ways to improve the delivery of evidence-based substance use treatment and training for practitioners in rural counties. The timing of our baseline needs assessment was during the first three months of COVID-19 in the United States. And to put it into context, on March 13th, Vermont's governor declared a state of emergency to help respond to COVID-19. So for our baseline needs assessment, we had 147 out of 689 practitioners respond to our survey. And that included with a financial incentive. So the, these were practitioners who were physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, working in a variety of practice settings uh, with the majority working in primary care. So my analysis today focus in on this sub, subset of 63 primary care physicians. There are 14 counties in Vermont and 11 of them are designated as rural counties. Our baseline needs assessment focused on these 11 rural counties highlighted in green. So our 63 primary care physicians were well distributed across the rural counties. Since we were launching our survey during COVID-19's pandemic, we decided to add a couple questions related to the impact of COVID-19 specifically. So the first question was, how has substance use changed since COVID-19? As you can see here, nearly 40% of primary care physicians reported that substance use had increased during COVID-19, while only 3% reported substance use decreased. The second question was, how has access to medications for addiction treatment changed since COVID-19? Here, the relationship was reversed. So nearly 35% of practitioners reported that access to treatment with medications for opioid use disorder decreased during COVID-19, while only 2% reported access to treatment had increased. We also asked practitioners about their level of concern about illicit drug use in general by their patients. The figure on the left shows the average level of concern about opioids and opiates on a scale from zero to 10. The average level of concern ranged from 6.1 for heroin to seven for combined opioids with alcohol. Concern for common drugs like tobacco and alcohol were also high. You can see those on the, the figure on the right. We're interested in the difference in who was wavered to provide MAT, specifically buprenorphine. We found that 43% of primary care physicians surveyed were wavered to prescribe buprenorphine across these counties. One of our goals at the center is to expand addiction treatment capacity in rural communities. And so we wanna understand associations between the concerns for patient drug use and their treatment capacity. Therefore, we asked the question, is a higher level of concern about opioid use associated with the physician being wavered to prescribe buprenorphine? So in the figure, uh, you see the average level of concern about opioids among those who were wavered is higher than among those who were not wavered. We see this as an opportunity for our team because there are physicians that have higher levels of concern about their patient opioid use, but are still not wavered to prescribe buprenorphine. So we're gathering data from all the states um, to look at these differences more closely with larger sample sizes. So in summary, during the first few months of COVID-19, primary care practitioners in rural areas perceived there to be an increase in substance use disorders, 
and a decrease in the availability of medications for addiction treatment. Finally, assessing level of concern about opioids may be an opportunity for engaging physicians to become wavered, particularly during COVID-19. Thanks so much for your attention and interest in our work. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Harder. Um, does anybody else have uh, questions for Dr. Harder's presentation? Hi, this is Martha. I don't know if you can hear me. We can yes. hear you. You can hear me. Okay, great. I'm so sorry. I'm in my car. Um, I'm just curious, um, Dr. Harder, whether you think that removing the requirement to be wavered would be a helpful move in terms of making sure that those who need treatment, especially during COVID, can get that treatment. Um, I'm not sure. And I realize that's a federal question. Yeah. <laughs> I might not be the, the best expert to ask about whether or not we should remove all the requirements. Um, I, I do know that we're working to support the physicians to become wavered. So whatever we are able to do right now within the guidelines, we are doing um, and responding to the needs of, of the physicians in our area. Um, I think maybe the, you know, Dr. Sigmund or the, the physicians on our physician, um, our, our physician council would be better equipped to to answer whether or not we should remove all those restrictions or not. Yeah, I agree with you, Valerie. I, I think it um, is unlikely that complete removal of those would be helpful. It may undermine progress in other areas of having kind of a standardized training and having everyone, you know, aware of safety parameters and stuff. But certainly anything we can do to facilitate their completion of these waiver trainings and now more than ever. Mm. So I think it, like anything, it's there's a balance that you point to. Thanks for the Thank question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think about it from the nurse practitioner point of view too, because as NPs, we complete um, more training, or more hours of training to get that waiver. Right. Um, so that's always a question in my mind. That's a good point, Martha. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, with a question in the chat of whether or not we expect these providers' perspectives to change over the course of the COVID pandemic. Um, well, yeah, perhaps they will change. Uh, we're, we're in the field now in New Hampshire, uh, fielding the baseline needs assessment for New Hampshire, and then we'll move into Maine and New York State. So it'll be really interesting to see what's happening. In addition, you know, six, seven, nine months into the pandemic in our neighbor states. Um, so that, thanks for the question. Um, Valerie, I have a question for you. I was just wondering if there's any relationship between the concern of the physicians, their concern level with opioids versus the percentage of their patients that are Medicaid patients versus what their regular, the rest of their patients are, if there's any relationship or correlation between those two numbers. So association between their level of concern and their percentage of patients who are on Medicaid. Um, I, we don't ask what percentage of your patients are on Medicaid. That is something that I could investigate because I do know um, the practitioners who responded to um, the survey and I do know which practices they work at. Um, and we can get an estimate based on claims data if we were to dig into it to see what percentage of the patients seen at that practice have Medicaid insurance at all in the year. So we could look at that, um, sort of dig into it a little more. I haven't done that yet. Um, I, I, I know that practices cannot um, choose what patients they, they can serve. Um, so, you know, they have to serve patients, the Medicaid populations. So I'm not, I was just curious if the ones that have a higher concern about opioids see a higher caseload of Medicaid patients versus those that that have a lower concern. I'm just wondering how that breaks down. Yeah, I think the demographics of the patient population at the practice definitely would influence their level of concern, especially if patient population are primarily, you know, they're a pediatrician and, you know, perhaps they're they're seeing very, very young patients and their patients are not involved in opioid use yet. I think that would be very different from an internal medicine practitioner um, or a geriatric practitioner, although substance use and opioid use is increasing problematically among older adults as well. So 
that's a really good point. And looking at the demographics of the patient population would definitely be associated. Valerie, did we, forgive me if I should know this, did we examine these questions about provider perceptions during COVID? Did we compare them for the HRSA designated rural versus non-rural counties yet? We are doing that. Okay, um, I can't we, remember. Yeah, I haven't compared those yet. Where. Okay. Because um, that will be interesting too, if yeah, where they're right. located may also influence how they so the are. Three, we have, uh, we expanded our baseline needs assessment, which I didn't mention, into the other three non-rural uh, counties in Vermont, and we've collected those. So we fielded that, uh, the same questionnaire to those practitioners, and it, we are planning to do some comparisons. So it'll be interesting to find out what it is. Our, our new research analyst, Nate, who's joined our team is, is leading up those comparisons. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, thanks for your questions. Yeah, um, great discussion going on. Um, we're gonna move on now to our final presentation and we have uh, Samara Raghavan and Kanchan Jha, I think, are you both presenting or? Okay, all right, so take it away you guys. Great, thanks, Rhiannon. Um, so I'm Samara, and this is my colleague, Kenshin. Uh, we're both research assistants with Dr. Stacey Sigmund here, again, at the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health at UVM. Um, and along with Dr. Peck, who's also on the call, we're the four co-authors uh, on this study. Um, and as Tatum mentioned, this is part of a larger umbrella study um, looking at reducing illicit opioid use and other risks during treatment delays and the efficacy of IBT. Um, and our study is actually looking at the BIPOC population within our sample. And so BIPOC um, is an acronym for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Uh, so we, our question is really, where are the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color in the rural opioid epidemic? Examining treatment needs in Vermont. So where are they? Well, in 2018, 1 1.2 million Black and 1.7 million Hispanic adults reported opioid misuse in the past year nationally, according to SAMHSA. The opioid epidemic has profoundly affected BIPOC communities. Black individuals are disproportionately incarcerated for drug-related charges. And particularly in Vermont, we have the highest rate of African-American males incarcerated nationally. Um, rates of drug overdose deaths have risen among Black Americans as well at a rate that exceeds that of other racial and ethnic groups. Despite these findings, Vermont state level data rarely includes the racial ethnic breakdown of individuals who seek opioid treatment. Um, the Department of Health does release a monthly report on users on MAT, but that doesn't break it down by racial demographics. So very little is known. There's a dearth of data in Vermont on BIPOC illicit opioid users. Um, so just as a first step towards better understanding these vulnerable populations in Vermont, we sought to characterize the demographic drug use treatment and legal histories of BIPOC enrolled in a series of studies um, under the umbrella IBT study. So in our, our study consisted of 137 participants um, who completed an intake assessment and were enrolled in the umbrella IBT study. At intake, participants completed a demographic and drug history questionnaire, as well as the addiction severity index. We asked the 137 participants to self-identify as white or six other categories that fall within BIPOC. Of the 137 participants, 14, 10.2% self-identified as BIPOC. Of these 14, 10 identified as American Indian, three as mixed race, and one as black. Table one kind of summarizes a handful of the participant characteristics that we looked at broken down by BIPOC and non-BIPOC. Um, we further looked at more specific, uh, specific to our study. So the first figure looks at the lifetime prevalence of opioid overdose. And it was actually 1.6 times higher among BIPOC than non-BIPOC, 42.9% and 26.8% respectively. Also, it's important to note that history of intravenous drug use was also greater in the BIPOC group at 71.4% versus 62.2%. The second figure shows that BIPOC and non-BIPOC participants reported similar rates of prior opioid treatment at 64.3% versus 61.6. And with regard to legal histories, figure three shows that 35.7% and 34.8% of BIPOC and non-BIPOC uh, uh, non participants reported more than one drug charge. 
And Samara will now delve further into what these results mean. Thank you. Thanks, Kenshin. So among the sample of untreated Vermonters with OUD, BIPOC presented with more severe opioid, opioid use on several measures, but particularly with regard to opioid-related overdose risk, which does uh, match up with the SAMHSA data um, as uh, BIPOC overdose rates are rising. Um, and it's really crucial and important to remember that the limited sample size prevented statistical analysis, uh, making it really hard to just thoroughly characterize the, experiment, uh, the experience of Vermont BIPOC opioid users without homogenizing this experience, right, which is something that we don't want to do. Um, so of course, obtaining more data is critical for improving our, understand, our understanding of racial disparities and treatment needs of BIPOC individuals. But we really think that where the efforts really need to lie is in recruiting a racially representative sample in all clinical drug abuse research, um, particularly to prevent the opioid-related overdoses, um, which we once again pointed out are rising in the introduction. Um, specifically, efforts are needed to recruit Black and Hispanic males, of which our study had none of. We had one African-American woman, um, no Hispanic or Latinx males, no African-American males, no Asian males. Um, so there really needs to be a lot more um, efforts around recruiting these particular folks. Um, so taken together, an improved understanding of treatment needs and challenges and prevention may help reduce the serious opioid-related consequences, particularly overdose, experienced by this vulnerable population. Um, in terms of future studies, uh, one could look at the intersection of rural BIPOC with OUD and socioeconomic status, insurance coverage, um, and incarceration rates to really understand the effect of systemic racism on this vulnerable population using opioids. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. And we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kelly Peck and Dr. Stacey Sigmund for all their support during this project. All right. Thanks, Samara and Kenshin. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any questions uh, for this presentation at this point? Yeah, I have a question. You mentioned we need to do a better job of recruiting the um, populations you mentioned. What are your suggestions for how to do that? Um, I assume you're thinking the recruitment strategies would be different for those populations. Can I take that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, that's a really good question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, I think that kind of looking at the general uh, perception of Vermont as being this very white state, right? Like there's no, um, that, that most of the people who live here are white. Um, I think it's even just recognizing that even though it's 4% BIPOC, that kind of equivalence is like 33,000 people, right? We obviously don't know how many of those 33,000 people are um, illicit opioid users because the state hasn't released that data. But um, I think that it's really understanding kind of where are, where are they? And a lot of the kind of BIPOC um, population is in jail or incarcerated. Um, uh, and so I think kind of looking at the access to MAT in kind of prisons would be a good place to look. Um, and also maybe looking at uh, community, uh, community centers and also probably adding that in as a question when we're doing an intake or when we're kind of looking as, you know, where, where else do you think that we could recruit? Asking the population itself, I think would be a really good and important place to start. Yeah, I think it's also important uh, since the POC community is so small in Vermont, there is definitely like a community vibe here in Vermont where the POC sticks together. So it would, it would be incredibly helpful to like have more community engagement and to be able to like fully understand where everyone is at. Right. And, and I think that just this first step um, of this study was really to even bring to light that we're uh, not representing kind of racially in, in our studies. And so I think just kind of looking at our own research and being like, do we even have gaps, you know, and, and where are they um, is really crucial. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah, it did. I think it would be an interesting study too to, to talk to your, a sub-study, talk to your participants and ask them the questions that you just said, you know, where would you find people like me? Yeah, thank you for your question. Right. Sorry, Martha, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, those folks 
Hello? that you talk to? Do you um, maybe someone can yeah, I'm message her yeah. and have her try again. That would be good too. Uh, yeah. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. Is that any better or no? No, it's no. not. <laughs> I'll, I'll email my question. Perfect. All right. It's, we it's look a great to idea. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have any other questions at sorry, the moment? Adam. Um, all right. Uh, does anyone else have uh, any questions at the moment for Samara and Kanchan? Uh, how about for all four of our, uh, five technically, of our uh, pre presenters today? I don't have any more questions. I just want to commend the presenters. This is kind of a fun round robin. And so nice job moderating and setting up the whole, um, this poster session. It's, it's makes, you know, they're fun to do in person and I wasn't sure how it would go on Zoom. So this has been, I think, successful. This is great. Yeah. And yeah, I want to thank nice all- Nice work, of everybody. Yeah, I was going to say thank you to all of uh, our wonderful presenters today with minimal technical issues, um, which is very surprising and always very heartening. I think, Nicole, you're um, muted. We have, um, since there are three groups going simultaneously, all the groups are being recorded. They will be up on our website and on our YouTube channel. So if you want to check them out, um, they will hopefully all be posted by uh, sometime next week. So um, you can check those out, any that you missed and wanted to, to see on your own. So I just wanted to plug that a little bit. Oh, and Nicole, are our posters going to be up on the website somewhere? The posters are up on the website. Um, there's like a quick uh, screen grab that you can't make out anything. And then there's a PDF version that everyone can open up. So you can, if you go to our event page um, down on the agenda where it says the um, virtual poster session, there's a poster session number one and a poster session number two. And you click on those links and that's where you can find everything. All right, that's great. Yep. Okay, so we have about five, six more minutes allotted for this poster session. Um, if anyone has any last minute lingering thoughts or comments, now's the time. I'm still thinking about our referral process for our randomized trials and increasing diversity there. And, you know, we talked about maybe the power of peer to peer referrals and we offer incentives for word of mouth referrals, like to one participant, if they refer someone else who's eligible, who completes an intake. Um, but that would be an interesting thing to revisit and see if we could customize it and kind of make it more robust in terms of um, as a mechanism for increasing the diversity of our, you know, participants in our, not just the IBT study, but all of our randomized trials. This may be that um, word of mouth referral that we always know is, could be a powerful source of referrals, but I, I always have this sense that it remains largely untapped, but that we could be more effective with that. Yeah. Oh, that too for for Kelly's recruitment that's going on right now. The same thing, and maybe Samara and Kanchan had some thoughts about Kelly's recruitment too in that same vein. Because if you're talking about some levels of PTSD, 
and maybe if you've been incarcerated and you have PTSD from being incarcerated, how that all doves, dovetails with what Kelly's working on. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. I mean, the, the other thing that came up in our research when we were doing like the, the literature review was that even the, the language in the ASI could be looked at because, you know, various different names are looked you know, are used for drugs in different communities. So kind of language is also really important. And also looking at just the history of, you know, clinical trials in America, like the Tuskegee trial, you know, and why is there a kind of distrust of the healthcare field? So kind of also understanding, I think, the systemic racism in America could really benefit from how to entice is not the right word, but, but how to get more participants of color uh, represented in our, in our studies. Um, so I, I think that's important as well, is just to really kind of look at, um, and, and so if one person feels really comfortable in our study, which there are, you know, 14 people of color, um, then that could also lead to a kind of communal trust um, so I think it's also about building building relationships and understanding where people are coming from, particularly as our kind of judicial system is so um, racially biased. Right. And I think that goes to also the concept of like, do I see, can I see someone there? So if I'm participating in a study, is there anyone who's working on that study that's reflective of me? So if everyone is white, am I going to come to a study where everyone is white right. and doing right. the work? So I think that's something that, you, you know, we all need to look at and work on. And I think it'd be um, interesting as well, like Valerie, perhaps, you know, a lot of this conversation has centered around research, our research um, through this lens, but it may be interesting too for us to consider what additional questions or approaches to add in our CORA work and the baseline needs assessment in um, asking providers about some of these um, questions too underrepresented populations and what they do. And so that could be kind of, that's also, um, you know, pretty untapped, um, but worthwhile. One thing that's coming to mind for me as well is, you know, just as we've been putting, working on putting this poster together, just, you know, it's been frustrating at times just because we don't have that much data. And so it seems like there's a real opportunity for even like qualitative research. Like if we were able to do some small, um, what do you call it? Like, uh, you know, just uh, interviewing people of color within Vermont and asking them about their experience, like, um, because we just don't know. And the, what I think a good first step would just be getting some qualitative data from these smaller groups of people so that then we can, that would inform our research efforts. What are things that we need to be looking at? What are questions that we need to be asking? Um, I, think, I think this is a, a really good thread to follow. So Kelly, if you um, if you come up with any qualitative questions that you would like to ask of practitioners, I mean we are fielding baseline needs assessments and qualitative piece is coming up. So we had a survey that was online and, and we are following up with some practitioners qualitatively. Um, we're also going to follow up with other groups. So people, family members of people who are using substances as well as people who are in treatment and who are substance use, uh, with substance use disorders. So if there are particular questions that you would like us to, to bring, potentially we might have someone we interview who is a person of color. Um, we could ask it from different perspectives. Um, so let us know, uh, you know, through, you can contact yeah, me directly or, or through Stacy uh, with Cora. Sanchin and Samara have really taken this torch and run with it. And so maybe we can find a way to, um, Maybe we can all find a way to connect because I know that this is something that they're excited about and would like to advocate for. Kelly, sounds great. Yeah, that sounds like a great. Thanks, Valerie. Amazing. All right. Um, so that we are at the end of this poster session. So thank you so much, everybody, for the wonderful presentations. And uh, sounds like we've got some collaborations uh, starting up here already. Thanks, so Shannon. The, Thank you, everybody. This is great. All right. So the, we'll have a 15 minute break and then there will be the next uh, round, round of poster sessions. All right. Bye, everyone. Shannon. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.